Right. Hi there, it's uh, Charlotte Bowen here from Birdhouse Projects Limited. Um, we're a children's arts organisation, cultural organisation, and uh, we're here to talk to Alexis Powell Howard from Fortis Therapy um, about where we're at now um, in terms of COVID and the impact. Um, we spoke to Alexis, it was two months ago now, um, we were really talking at that time about coping with the anxiety um, around lockdown, um, how to manage children's emotions, um, not to have too high expectations of yourself in that time, and just generally how people were feeling um, in order to try and help families a little bit. So we thought we'd come back and talk to Alexis now we're two months further down the line. And a lot's changed. Um, there's been obviously a lot of developments. We're all aware of the impact of COVID now in terms of you know the impact on people and the NHS um, and then there's been other developments such as Dominic Cummins, there's been Black Lives Matter and there's been really lots sort of going on globally um, that I think you know has led to a little bit of overwhelm as well and that's on top of dealing with things in your own life such as you know children going back to school, how we're still maintaining um, looking after potentially parents, um, our own job security, financial security. So we're here to talk to Alexis again about how we can maybe look at some more strategies for seeing ourselves through um, the next period that we face. So Alexis, did you want to just tell us a bit about Fortis Therapy again? Yeah, so um, I can't believe it's two months since we last spoke, actually. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm the managing director of Fortis Therapy and Training, and we provide um, therapy uh, to all ages. So um, our youngest client currently is four years old, and we work all the way through. Um, so we provide that face-to-face, -face, or we were doing, in our buildings. We've got offices in Grimsby, Laos, Scunthorpe and Hull. Um, and we've moved everything online, so we're providing all of that to all of those ages online. Um, so we're, we support with mental health, all sorts of different difficulties and, um, you know, experiences and histories and um, just to really help people to be able to en enjoy life and engage with life as it is, uh, you know, now, I suppose. Um, we also provide lots of training around mental health and emotional well-being. We help businesses to embed well-being in their business. Um, we also provide mediation and coaching. So really anything to do with people we're, we're in. Uh, we like working with people and seeing the best in them, being able to help them to function the best way they can. So yes. over the last couple of months since I last saw you, we've, we've provided all our services using platforms like this, um, using mobile phones, using telephone, you know, FaceTime, whatever we can do really, just to make sure we could continue to help people throughout. Yeah, that sounds obviously very useful um, yeah. at the moment. Um, so I was wondering, Alexis, um, what what you're getting a sense of in terms of the general mood or mindset that's coming through. I mean, as I said, I talked about that sense of overwhelm and I think after uncertainty about the virus itself, there's now massive uncertainty about life in general. Um, so I wondered what kind of things you're seeing coming through. Yeah, I think the word overwhelm is absolutely right, really. Um, I think there's, especially, we've, we've kind of seen themes each week as things have happened um, or as advice has been given by the government. You know, if it hasn't been clear, which, it, you know, it hasn't been at times, um, people have felt very uncertain and, and quite insecure, really, because what am I supposed to do for the best? So, and you're right about that global um, kind of idea as well that we've had the the pandemic which has been global and now we've got protests which are global and um you know different governments making decisions um and just kind of watching all these things play out and act out um and i think what we're seeing especially in the last couple of weeks is a real sense of uncertainty and a lack of direction for people um because lockdown felt alien enough to begin with and people kind of got their head around it and to some extent and and accepted that this is what we have to do as hard as that might have been for some and other people absolutely loved it um you know so there's been some real kind of reactions to lockdown um but we're looking now to come loosen that and i think part of it is that the world doesn't feel safe at the moment um you know the virus has still got quite a lot of unknown aspects to it um the protests and black lives matter and you know um Dominic Cummings even, you know, with all of that, different rules for different people. And, you know, there's all this confusion that gets thrown into the pot. So 
I think now people are starting to look to, well, what does it mean for my future? If they've got a job and they've been furloughed or if, you know, I'm hearing about redundancies left, right and centre, um, you know, what, what does that mean for people? How does it impact, impact on them financially? What does it mean when people talk about recession? So then we look at putting children back into school and some people feel like that's almost like, you know, sacrificing your children to go back into education. And so there's a hell of a lot of, of different decisions people are having to make. And often I think... In a lot of households, there are several different scenarios going on, you know, whether that might be about people's jobs and security, schooling, um, it could be about relationship breakdowns, um, you know, there's, uh, it could be about people shielding, being carers for other people in the family, there's, it's a real mixing pot and I think that's what leads to this feeling of where do I even start to unpick it, especially when I don't know what my direction actually is. Yeah, no, I think it's there's, there's obviously a lot on people's minds, and um, you know, I think it's from what I can see, it's leading to insomnia for one for a lot of people who are going to bed with all this on their minds, and then they're waking up with it. Um, and you know, do you think people have sort of hit a bit of a slump? Some people, anyway, because I think before when we talked about there being sort of two camps in lockdown, where there were those that it seemed to really affect. Um, mentally and then others who were, were almost celebrating because um, they have that time to themselves and do, do you feel that that's shifted now where there is this real general sense of everybody's um, going through this you know strange process uh, together of you know, figuring out what life does look like now? Yeah I think that um, you know there's people who really enjoyed lockdown when it was really nice and sunny and they could get out in the garden and it felt a bit like you we were on holiday you know and you could kind of bubble yourself off in that way I think um, the weather's changed and circumstances are starting to change. You know, we're starting to be allowed back into places. Um, and, you know, that kind of bubble is going to be burst. And I think that really, you know, we, we talk about bubbles in schools, don't we? There's a lot of that conversation going on, but it literally is something that we're having to think about. Um, how do we want to do that? And um, you write about sleep. Um, we've put out loads of tips in the last two weeks about sleep just because we're seeing that it's really impacting on um you know rest and when we're not sleeping properly we're not particularly rational yeah. um you know we're a bit like children you know if your child's had a really bad night's sleep you know the next day is going to be a bit of a nightmare and it's the same thing for us mm -hmm. we don't make the we don't make rational decisions we don't feel rational we don't want to be rational actually we, we know we're, we're fed up yeah. um so i think that we're seeing different reactions and responses and mm -hmm. um you know where people have maybe been locked down um I don't know quite a nice place to be in some ways for some people the risk now of redundancy or the risk of having to go back to work and get back into some kind of normality not the normality but some kind of normality um I think is starting to raise lots of what if lot of lots of what now you know um and there isn't necessarily a definitive answer to that either which I think is also what's causing some of this feeling of you know yeah. feeling quite slumped and low and low in mood I think yeah and you know potentially demotivated as well and it's you know how do we how do we get that sense of routine back and even motivation when we don't know what we're feeling motivated for so it's almost you know where do you start with that yeah well your motivation it's like it's, i think for some people it can feel like they've lost their way a bit like i don't know what i don't know what my way is anymore um and i think motivation is is something that we we really wish we had all the time but we don't it ebbs and flows it really is a kind of you know wobbly line and sometimes we'll feel really motivated um and you know be spurred into action about something and sometimes we really just don't feel that at all and for me i think with that it's around your mindset it's about your mood and where you how you're feeling it could be hormonal as well it could be tiredness exhaustion um but accepting that actually you're not going to feel motivated all the time that there are going to be there'll be a day when you wake up and you think I really want to go and do that today and you'll do it mm. but don't give yourself a hard time the next day if you don't feel like you want to continue it you know yeah. it's just where we're at and it's I think giving ourselves a bit of a break and a bit of permission to just feel yeah. a bit low at times and that it doesn't feel good but it does feel like that's kind mm. of natural I think that's what we said previously it was about um you know making your to-do list a lot smaller <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think it is, it's, it is difficult to, you know, get those things done if you're working from home, for example, in the same way as you would have done before, because there's so much else going on in your head. So I think it's being gentle with yourself, being realistic about what you expect from yourself. And we also talked before about, 
you know, to having too high expectations of what you were going to do. And maybe you then start judging yourself because you haven't done what you set out to do. And, um, you know, it felt like, you know, let's make the most of this opportunity. Um, but it's whether, you know, that fits really with the reality of what's happening. Yeah, um, and, and it, I think, I, I mean, I saw a post on, um, I think it was on LinkedIn, and it was like, you know, if you haven't written a book by the end of lockdown, what have you been doing? I was like, <laughs> that's <yeah>. really helpful. <laughs> you know set, let's set ourselves up to fail um it's just i yeah. think you, you're right that the the motivation of it's difficult when to have motivation and be motivated when you don't know where you're heading yeah yeah so where do you think um people parents can start with even a sense of structure again um and feeling that there's a point of the day even um you know because i think routines get really skewed in in they have done in these circumstances so it's like how can we put a bit of structure back and get keep getting to a routine especially get kids into a routine hmm. yeah well i think i i think the routine isn't just about focusing on your daytime i think it's also about what you do in the evening with a fam if you've got a family with you yeah. um because you're right we we're not getting up at the times we normally would do we're not having to travel anywhere for the for the majority of us um and it's it, it becomes very difficult when you are trying to um manage children in a household that maybe haven't got as much school input as they did do um the way i would the way i've looked at that as a mum, i've got three children at all different ages and um i've kind of worked out you know like, almost like morning afternoon evening and what is it that i think we all should be doing in those times I'm working full time. My husband's working full time. Um, so we, we actually haven't got the capacity to sit with children and do activities uh, in the day. But we can do things in the evening. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and we all work at different times in different ways, don't we? So I know I work better in the morning. By Friday afternoon, I literally, there's no point in talking to me because I'm worn out. <laughs> um, so I've structured my working pattern differently um, and the schooling pattern is different you know so if it's about structuring something and actually just putting in we're going to be you'll be creative at that point you're going to do some numeracy at this point or you're going to do whatever the ages of the child yeah. um you start to structure your your purpose um for everyone because if you're if you are losing that track mm -hmm. as an adult and a parent in the family nobody in the family will probably have it um because mm -hmm. they're looking to you to know what to do um, yeah. and in an evening you know putting in treat nights and movie nights and games nights and yeah. you know painting nights or whatever it, it doesn't matter we've done loads of different things yeah. which is all about that interaction and that that time together which we probably wouldn't have had actually normally because we would be running around taking people to activities and all that kind of stuff yeah I mean I think you hit on something there when you said the word purpose um because I guess that's what we're saying it's there, there isn't that sense of purpose because we don't know what the purpose is <laughs> overall so it's almost creating your own daily sense of purpose isn't it and yeah. into get out of bed for structure your day um, into, well, not even use the word achieve, you know, it's not something that you tick off, I guess, at this stage, but it's just about feeling that there's something that you put in place that you're, you know, there's a purpose to it. Yeah, and I think it's that bit about, oh, I've done something today. Yeah. You know, it, it, otherwise the days start to go into, fall into, you know, each other, don't they? And it's like, yeah. oh, God, just another day. And um, that doesn't, that doesn't do us any good from a mental health point of view at all. No. And I also think for some reason, you know, the time seems to be going really quickly. Um, <laughs> if we are drifting from day to day, there's no differentiation. And then you are, you know, even weeks have gone by. Um, but it's getting that balance right between thinking you should be doing something um, and, you know, doing it for your own satisfaction or pleasure or purpose in your yeah. And I think as well, don't, if you haven't done something you know or you've had days where actually you've been struggling don't look at that as lost time mm -hmm. you know it's almost like I've wasted that time well you haven't because that's just where you're at at that point so yeah. again it's like that internal kind of conversation where we can kind of berate ourselves for not having achieved something and yeah. I don't, I'm not sure what achievement really is at the moment I think you know if you can get out of bed in the morning and you've had some decent food throughout the day you've drunk plenty of water and you've managed to do some things with your children and you've maybe managed to do some work yeah. that's pretty good I would yeah, say it obviously makes a difference like you said when the sun's out and um, we can be outside enjoy the garden um, and it did almost have that holiday vibe for a while and I think when it's a day like this which is a bit grayer um you do get that more should we say gloomy feel um <laughs> but it's yeah I guess it's just putting some structures in place 
isn't it? And just thinking about, you know, as parents, how can we equip ourselves to emotionally support children, even if they're not even displaying obvious signs of being um, mentally upset about things? Because um, there's a lot going on in their heads as well, I guess. Who knows what's yeah. going on in their heads? Mm. Yeah, and they interpret things depending on the developmental stage and their age. They, do, they interpret things in a certain way. Um, I, I think I think it's quite difficult at the minute for parents because they're in with children all the time, or in, they're in their household with their children all the time. Um, whereas you might, you know, go and see a friend and, and offload, or you might kind of ring someone up. Generally, if you've got everyone around you, it's quite difficult to do that. Um, but I would say is to kind of try and block some time in for yourself and I know that's really hard because I'm living it um mm. but you know go and go and take some time out if it's having a bath or if it's listening to a book or if it's reading or you know watching a movie or a series that you really like just do something that actually feels like you're a, a human as well because um it definitely impacts if we're feeling anxious and worried that filters through to everybody else yeah. Um, and then we've got to deal with that as well. And children are interpreting things all the time. So I would definitely recommend not having, you know, radios on all the time with lots of news bulletins, yeah. you know, manage how much social media people are accessing because that's definitely impacting um, yeah. on how people are feeling. Yeah. And I think at the beginning of um, when the virus hit and it hit the mainstream media, um, you know, we might have tried to shield our kids from that because it was very serious and, you know the risk and the danger you know was coming through in these messages um but it, that almost feels like that's gone out the window because it's infiltrated everything so they know as much as we do actually and we won't have been able to stop ourselves talking about it in front of them because it just no <laughs> yeah and, and then they they will interpret that in their own way so and i think if we're feeling as adults that that's quite relentless we need to put some we need to buffer yeah. that a bit um and and it's because things on on social media are being updated so regularly as well it always feels like there's something different there's something new and yeah. i was talking to somebody last week a, a, a dad actually and he was he was saying i'm feeling really short-tempered with my children and i you know i've got no headspace yeah. and we talked about what he was doing when he had you know a few minutes downtime and he was reading twitter um, yeah. which actually can be quite a cesspit <laughs> of, yeah. of human you know interaction at times and we just agreed he would delete it so we yeah. deleted twitter and immediately kind of 48 hours later kind of messaged me and said i feel so much better so you know that knock-on impact of we can we can focus on what we need to do for children's well-being but actually if we're looking after our own we will automatically be more able and have more capacity to look after theirs um yeah. It's a really good point because I think with all these debates that are happening on social media, like everything seems to be dividing everybody. So there was obviously the pandemic in the first place and how the government handled that. Then there was Dominic Cummins and there's Black Lives Matter. And it's like, it's, be, it's really divisive stuff. So you can go into social media and come out feeling that you've been in some kind of battle, you know. Yeah, yeah. See what you're saying, that you know, almost save yourself from that. Um, but I, I guess people feel, you know, they do, there's a lot of opinions out there at the minute and people feel like they want an opinion on it. But does it yeah, actually feel good, you know? No, no, I don't think it does. I, I also think as well with some of these things, they are so emotive that actually whatever you say is going to offend somebody. Mm. And if you, you know, and if you've got the resilience and the capacity to manage that, then that's, that's you know, and you kind of enjoy that interaction, then that's different. Mm. But for most people... Um, they don't have that capacity and mm -hmm. so um, you know you put something out there with probably very best intentions and that's not what you get back um, and I think you just got to protect yourself from that because you know you have a choice whether you put yourself in that circumstance or not yeah 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 that's good thinking so obviously with children going back to school and um, that was year year one reception and year six so year next. six some parents have chosen to send them back. They might be still worried about how that's going. They might be relieved. There's parents who have um, still kept the children off who are still trying to manage homeschooling. And I think that's complex as well because either way, you could be worrying about whether you're doing the right thing. You know, if you've sent them back, am I doing the right thing? If I've kept them at home, am I doing the right thing because they're not at school with their friends and et cetera. Um, so how do you think you can manage either side on that you know if you're worried about the choices I think I think people have to make their decisions based on what feels right for them mm -hmm. I really really believe that because you've got to weigh up your situation um I decided to send my I've got my youngest is year six um and I decided to send her to um back to school 
um, she needed the structure. She was she was doing school work, and you know she was seeing her friends on Teams or whatever they were using. But I just felt that was the right thing for it. it didn't mean to say I didn't have a wobble about it the week before and think, God, what what if what if you know coronavirus is in the school? And but my circumstances are it's a small village school. There's a very limited amount of children. Um, you know she hasn't been anywhere the whole of lockdown. So this is the first time she'd been somewhere. And that was my decision. And but I totally understand other people have made decisions based on the fact that it felt too risky, um, yeah. and you know that they weren't sure or didn't trust that schools were doing things the right way or for the right reasons. I also we also work in a lot of schools, and I also know the deliberations and the heartache really that a lot of head teachers have gone through about do I do this because if somebody gets ill, am I then responsible? You know, even though they wouldn't be seen to be responsible, they would feel it. So I don't think that there's been a really kind of clear way through for that um so i think if people have had to you're right if, if they've still got children at home i was talking to somebody earlier who's a key worker still got children at home and um is working all the hours god sends working from home and finding it incredibly difficult and actually in that circumstance to to help you know this working mom mm -hmm. um is it better for the child to be um in school because it creates a bit of space for everyone and she can focus on what she needs to do and then have time back with them when they're home uh, again that's an individual circumstance i don't think there's a right or wrong i do think people have felt pressured yeah. um and have, have all been very defensive about their decisions mm. um in general from what i've seen um but i don't think you can say well you've done it for the wrong reasons whichever way you've gone yeah yeah and for those people who, um, you know, during lockdown, thinking, right, I, I don't want to go back to my job. <laughs> I, I want to do this thing that I've been dreaming about. And, you know, um, this might have started having initial thoughts about that. And now doing that might feel a bigger challenge, you know, to, to leave a job. If that's if you've still got one anyway. Um, and then to create a new scenario for yourself. So how would you say somebody who wants to approach changing making changes like how would they approach that right now well i think um i i think the way to frame that is to look as an opportunity so you know yes you might be going back to a job where actually you thought i don't really want to do this job anymore mm -hmm. um you may find that that decision is made for you in restructures and things um or in businesses that are struggling at the minute um, and therefore you would have to kind of really get motivated to get moving with whatever idea you've got. Um, or you go and find work elsewhere and you do that as a part-time thing alongside and build it up. Um, and I think we've all had chance to reflect, even in those, I mean, we've been busy at Fortis, but that doesn't mean to say I haven't had some more time than I normally would. Um, so we've all had time to reflect and think about what does the future hold and what do we actually want to what's our legacy you know what do we want to have achieved if you like and if you're passionate about something or if you see something actually you've always wanted to have a go at I, I think just go and have a go at it um it doesn't mean you say you have to leave a full-time job in order to do that you might decide right I'm going to either reduce my hours because I can afford to or you might just start doing something in an evening you block the time out to have a go you might also think I've got a great idea and I'm really passionate about it but I'm just not motivated at the minute and that's fine as well um but I, I know for me, when I decided to do Fortis, set up Fortis, I was working full time in the NHS and I reduced my days to four days a week. So I had a Friday yeah. um, to go and try stuff yeah. and, you know, talk to people and yeah. learn how to write what I needed and all that kind of thing. I wouldn't have been able to do that with yeah. a family in a full time job otherwise. And I think, um, you know, there's lots of information out there as well, as well as like coaching videos and stuff like that. You know if people did want to look at the transition in their lives there's a lot to help them um, and that actually might give some people a sense of purpose at this time if they've had an idea bubbling under you know to tentatively you know start investigating it but maybe without that pressure on themselves as we've said um, but yeah I think it's an opportunity um, in some ways for people who are thinking about making changes um, so it was it was good news um, last night about the family well not family bubble it was I can't remember what they called it but a bubble um, so that will be obviously interpreted in different ways for whoever it applies to um, but yeah it does mean that potentially that um, a family can then bring a grandparent into you know the, the bubble and that should do a lot to relieve um, loneliness and get that sense of connectivity back even a few hugs 
Um, yeah. So I think that's that's something, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I, I really think that kind of separation of the generations has been really tricky. Yeah. Um, my my dad immediately messaged me and said, I'm moving in. <laughs> uh, I was like, no, 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 that's not what this means. Uh, yeah, so it is, it's that just wanting to be with your family, isn't it? And actually, you know, be able to um, have that fun back with each other and yeah. also support as well, because I think we all support each other. I know my family, you know, I'm very supported by um, both sets of grandparents. Um, mm -hmm. And that's massively helpful for us as a family and the children love it as well. But when that's all separated off, it's felt a lot like we've lost each other. You lose yeah, touch, don't it, you? Even, you know, the visits in the garden, it's just really strange with this sort of invisible barrier. You know, you can't afford, you can't get too close. You have to keep reminding kids you can't do this, you can't do that. It's, yeah, I know. it's been difficult emotionally, I think, and just felt weird and obviously not nice. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to sort of get that back. Um, and start to normalise in that way with our family, close family relationships, really. Um, yeah, and then I was just thinking about, you know, when, when people do feel a bit low and everything, something that's often suggested is to sort of count your blessings and have gratitude and that kind of thing, um, which, you know, I think works well. Um, but do you think that can be difficult in this kind of weird, transitional, confusing, unstable time? And mm. how... How can people sort of feel gratitude or, you know, um, that they, they do count the blessings and that kind of thing when, when they feel so uncertain? Mm. I think it's really difficult. I mean, that phrase, count your blessings, is definitely one that I grew up with and, and hearing, you know, definitely from grandparents, just count your blessings. Um, we talk about gratitude and mental health because it's incredibly grounding and it's really helpful. Um, because it means that when we are, um, when, we're, when we're feeling grateful for what we have, we're actually living in the here and now. You know, we can look around and say, well, I'm really healthy. I'm really, I'm really pleased and I feel very grateful for the fact that people are well. You know, that might be your bottom line at the minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it might be that you're grateful for having a roof over your head. It might be grateful you've got nice food on the table or that you, you're able to, to feed your family, that kind of thing. It comes down to those basic needs. Mm -hmm. But I also appreciate that when you're feeling, when you're struggling and it's from a, um, you know, your capacity, you're, you're full and you're overwhelmed, that becomes very difficult to make space for mm -hmm. it's difficult to make space for um anything other than feeling quite woeful and sad and lost and everything else so i would say just it's about recognizing those small things it's really small steps you know recognizing what is uh what is there to be grateful for in very small bite-sized chunks really and if you're watching your children play for example if they're living in your house with you and there's a moment where they kind of laugh together or there's a the moment where they're not rowing or falling out you know grab it and just kind of try and remember that because those are the things that we start to just pass us by because we're too yeah. worried um and too concerned about the future yeah i think that's a great message and probably a good place to leave this um discussion today um, but it's been great to talk to you again um, and maybe we'll have another catch up in a month or two so yeah know. that'd be great um, but thank you very much i think your input's obviously really valuable you know in supporting parents and children out there um that might be connecting with us um so i wish you good luck with everything you're doing and we'll speak to you again thank you. soon thank you thanks for having me thank you